best friends can either toast you or they can roast you. And I'm so grateful that he remembers the good things and not the bad things that happened to us as student call porters. We had a lot of maturing to do, to put it mildly, in those days. I also mentioned last night that this is a very historic weekend for me personally. Fifty years ago, as an 18-year-old academy kid, I preached my first sermon here in the Bay Knoll Seventh-day Adventist Church. It was entitled, By the Grace of God, Sam. And I held up a typewritten copy of that sermon, typed by my girlfriend at the academy at the time. And as those who were here last night know, I even wore my academy navy blue blazer, which I can still button in the front, just to add to the historicity of that moment. And it's just real special to me to be invited back, where my seminar band group put on a special Sabbath program for the members of the Bay Knoll Church in 1968. We even brought a guitar here. The principal of Union Springs Academy did not approve of guitars. But we brought a guitar, played it softly, and nobody in the Bain Old Church objected. So we really like you folks. You are avant-garde, forward-looking, uh, open-minded Christians, and you made us feel wonderfully welcome, wonderfully welcome. So I have wonderful memories of 50 years ago coming here to the Bay Knoll Seventh-day Adventist Church. Those of you who were here last night, we uh, presented Loughborough's childhood and his youth and his young manhood in Victor, New York. Just what, about 18 miles south of you? And that's where our tour will be this afternoon, about 2 o'clock. We'll go to some of the authentic spots that are connected with J.N. Loughborough's life. Uh, this morning, we're going to move on from that into his early ministry, some of his missionary endeavors, some of his publishing endeavors, and uh, some of the tragedies that he faced, uh, particularly with the loss of uh, two of his wives. So picking up where we left off, Loughborough's close association with the church leaders, James and Ellen White and Joseph Bates, proved advantageous to him. Recognizing the inconvenience of using borrowed horses and wagons, as Linda told in the children's story, James White actually started a horse fund. That's what it was labeled in the review, to buy John Loughborough a horse of his own. When certain members criticized John Loughborough for following the fashions of the day by wearing a mustache and a goatee, Instead of a full, bushy beard, Ellen came to his defense. She asserted, Brother Loughborough is letting all the beard grow that God has given him. <laughs> and when God gives him some more, he will let that grow too. <laughs> During 1855 and 56, Loughborough teamed up with Elder W.S. Ingram and Elder Samuel Rhodes for preaching forays all across the state of New York and Pennsylvania. And as Linda told in the story this morning, when they came to a swollen stream with old Charlie hitched to the wagon, Lupro fell into the water and nearly drowned. Despite his proximity to Lake Ontario, and several streams in this area, he never ever learned to swim. And on that particular occasion, it nearly cost him his life. To pay their expenses, they helped the farmers harvest hay during the day at $4 a week. That must have been backbreaking labor for the tiny Loughborough. As I pointed out last evening, he was only five feet four inches tall, he never weighed over 120 pounds. So he was truly a little Irish leprechaun of a figure. And haying is hard work. I did it once. I said never again. Never again. Nonetheless, 
After one seven-week tour of central New York, John declared, the blessings of the Lord have been with me, and I've had some excellent times in striving to speak the word of truth to the people. I think the cause is rising somewhat. Indeed, it was. And yet, overworked, underfed, and underpaid, John and his wife Mary, understandably, from time to time, became discouraged. They were depressed at their future prospects. As I pointed out last night, preachers didn't get a salary. They depended on donations from the people they preached to as they travel about the countryside. And sometimes they got much and sometimes they got nothing. In the fall of 1856, the Loughboroughs joined a dozen or more Adventist farmers and businessmen who moved out to Waukon, Iowa to start all over again. Using his carpentry skills, John worked for his old friend, Jonathan Orton, who was also a Rochester man. But over two nights in November, he saw a cross a pure white light in the sky. Was it an omen of good or was it an omen of evil? With the arrival of James and Ellen White on Christmas Eve, he found his answer. What doest thou here, Elijah? Ellen White asked John. Not once, but three times. After hearing Mrs. White preach the Laodicean message, Mary and John and their friends feeling properly rebuked, repented. And John committed himself to returning to the gospel ministry. As if to make up for the lost time, Loughborough teamed up with Ellen White and six other preachers for a whirlwind evangelistic tour of the states of Illinois, Wisconsin, and Iowa in 1857. You have to remember, this is all on foot or by horse. Three states. He returned to Battle Creek, Michigan in November to give the dedicatory sermon for the Adventist second meeting house there. That winter, he and Mary moved into a furnished home on Champion Street that had been provided for them by their Adventist friends in Michigan. Over the next 10 years, Mary would take in boarders to help meet expenses. It was in this humble, tiny home that they would experience both joy and sorrow. Joy in the birth of their daughter Teresa in 1858 and their son Delmer in 1864, but also sorrow with Teresa's tragic death at the age of two. For six months labor of the type I've just been describing, Elder Loughborough received the following remuneration. Three 10-pound cakes of maple sugar. Ten bushels of wheat. Five bushels of apples. Five bushels of potatoes. One ham. Half a hog. One peck of beans. And four dollars in cash. And yet, he rejoiced that God had converted 16 souls in his 16 meetings. Without question, however, the implementation of the first tithing plan, it was called the Systematic Benevolence Plan. The nickname they gave it was the Sister Betsy Plan. Sister Betsy, in 1859, brought him much needed financial relief. Before that time, there was no regular way of supporting our ministers. Now, during the 1860s, Elder Loughborough played several key roles in church organization at every level. During 1860, he helped organize local churches throughout the states of Michigan, Illinois, and Wisconsin. He helped them gain legal protection over their property, and he drew up the church covenant, the very language of the covenant that all of our early Adventist churches used when they formed a congregation. Lepro supported James White also in urging the necessity of incorporating the Seventh-day Adventist Publishing Association. As the Civil War began in 1861, he secured military exemption for Adventist young men from the governor, 
the state of Michigan. But it's interesting that Elder Loughborough also flew the American flag above his evangelistic tents. We don't know of any other minister that did that. Also in 1861, he helped to organize conferences in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Illinois. As far as Civil War went, uh, Elder Loughborough would actually go down to the railroad station where the troops were embarking for the battlefields down south, and he would pray for the departing Union troops before they left. A nice patriotic gesture. In 1863, despite an attack of the agu, we learned last night that was the 19th century term for malaria, he took a leading role in drawing up a new constitution for the General Conference. And then he wrote the first manual on how to organize churches and conferences. To draw public attention to his discourses, that's what he called them, we would call them sermons, Lepro paid to advertise his tent meetings in the local newspapers. And as far as I know, he was the first Adventist pastor evangelist to do that, to actually pay for a newspaper ad for his meetings. The ads appeared in 1862 in the Republican newspaper in Charlotte, Michigan, when he and Moses Hull were preaching together. They got spectacular results. The first night, they had 200. The second night, they had 400. The third night, they had 600. By the end of the week, they had over 1,000 people coming in by horse and buggy, horse and wagon, to attend their meetings. Ellen White sent John a testimony assuring him that God would make him a triumphant conqueror if he followed his will. Of course, a few, uh, a few months uh, earlier, she had also sent a testimony to his wife, Mary, warning her not to be wearing those new hoops that other women were wearing, a sinful practice. Health reform, like dress reform, met with some resistance from many early Adventists, but not, not from the Loughboroughs. You may recall Ellen White had her first health reform vision in June of 1863. And when John and Mary Loughborough learned about it, they began weaning themselves from meat. And they cut their use of salty, sweet, and greasy foods. In his articles in Lifestyle, Elder Loughborough became a model health reformer. He outlived all the other pioneers, and he died at the age of 92. In 1866, he would take a leading role in organizing our first Western Health Reform Institute. Later, it would change its name, of course, to Battle Creek Sanitarium. But he was the one who organized the institute first. He also started a new health-related journal called The Health Reformer, for which he wrote many of the articles. But you know, overwork nearly killed him in 1865. Besides preaching and writing and organizing churches, he filled so many offices. He was auditor of the Publishing Association. He was president of the Michigan Conference. He was one of three general conference officers. And then the Whites asked him to spend the winter with Moses Hall, holding meetings throughout New England. So he was exceptionally busy, and it affected his health. He was near physical and emotional collapse. And so with a bunch of our other preachers, including Uriah Smith and James White, he went to Dr. Jackson's home on the hillside in Dansville. I don't imagine it's still there. It was there when, when Bill and I were canvassing in the 60s, but uh, it was already 150 years old. I imagine it's fallen down now. But it was an interesting building to look at. Four months of rest, relaxation, and recuperation finally brought Elder Loughborough back to health again. Shortly after his recovery, we find him in 1866 preaching out in Iowa, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Ohio, Michigan, and Indiana, organizing new churches and conferences and raising funds for the Western Health Reform Institute. 
In addition, he became the first editor of The Health Reformer, and after months of diligent research, he wrote the book Physiology and Hygiene in 1867. Kind of a practical home medical how to do it manual. So it was Loughborough and not Dr. Kellogg that actually wrote the first health book in our denomination. Although Loughborough was one of Ellen White's chief defenders, he wrote a two-part article in the Review, January of 1867, called Remarkable Fulfillment of Her Visions. That didn't spare him from her rebukes. Later that spring, he publicly apologized in writing, in the review, for making money selling photographs. That was a practice that Ellen White disapproved of for our Adventist ministers, making money on the side. Okay? Despite his occasional harsh words and his temper throughout his life, Loughborough would always be quick to apologize, to repent, and publicly to ask for forgiveness. He was even known to ask for forgiveness at camp meetings and to relate a testimony that Ellen White had given him, to read it to the people and ask for their forgiveness. Ellen White, likewise, was quick to forgive and extend moral support and sympathy to John and Mary. Despite her rebukes, they remained very close friends, the Whites and the Loughboroughs. Now, John needed Ellen's sympathy in June of 1867 because his pregnant wife, Mary, battling scrofula, a lack of vitamins in her diet, had a bad fall, and she died days later, giving birth to two daughters. One of the girls died. The other one, named Mary, after her mother, lived. Three Adventist ministers preached at Mary Loughborough's funeral. The Cornells cared for the tiny baby, while John's brother, William, who lived south here in Victor, rushed to take care of three-year-old son, Delmer. John Loughborough wrote in his diary, oh, how lonely, how lonely. Mary was only 35 years of age. John drowned his sorrows in work. He entered a one-year medical course. He kept up a busy schedule of preaching, and he finished writing the 230-page book, Physiology and Hygiene. In the meantime, he had begun dating again a charming New York-born brunette named Maggie Ann Newman, who lived with her parents near Lansing, Michigan. On June 12, 1868, John and Mary got married in Victor, New York, in the church which his grandfather had built. But over the previous three months, John had experienced a series of 20 troubling dreams. As I mentioned last night, Ellen White often validated Loughborough's dreams as coming from God. He never called them visions. She didn't call them visions. But oftentimes, God was leading Elder Loughborough through night dreams. In these 20 dreams, Elder Loughborough saw himself traveling west to California and at that time, California was a sparsely settled frontier. Now, unbeknownst to him, his fellow minister, uh, Daniel T. Bordeaux, who had been having similar dreams, had already sold his farm in Vermont and was gathering his earthly goods to be ready to go to California, if the brethren asked him to go. Both men attended the general conference session in Battle Creek <clears throat> in May, both of them heard James White make an appeal. Is anyone interested in going to California? And both men responded, they were ready. If that's what God wanted them to do, they would go to California. John wrote in his diary, this morning, May 31, the matter was decided about my going to California, C-A-L-A-F-O-R-N-I-A. John Loughborough never met a new word he couldn't misspell. 
He was a really poor speller. Or you might say he was just a creative speller. He found new ways to spell old words. He says, I wrote Maggie and I am selling off all our things. Two weeks after their wedding, John and Maggie, Delmer and baby Mary, with the Bordeaux family, boarded the ship Rising Star in New York City to head for San Francisco. You see, the Union Pacific Railroad was not completed until 1869. And this is a year before that. So they had to go all the way down to Panama, cross the Isthmus of Panama, 50 miles of malaria-infested jungle, catch another ship and go all the way back up to San Francisco. The only other choice is to take a pair of oxen and a wagon, right, the Conestoga wagon, and spend three or four months crossing the United States with all the dangers that presented. So they went by ship instead. It was a 6,000 mile voyage all the way to San Francisco. But you know, unbeknown to them, a certain Mr. Wolf, who lived near Petaluma, California, had seen them coming in a dream he had at night. And with his friend, Mr. Hugh, had read a newspaper notice of their arrival. A California newspaper had picked up a notice from a New York City newspaper that these two men were on their way to California and published it. Both Mr. Wolf and Mr. Hugh were deeply Christian men. And so they rushed down to the docks at San Francisco, just in time to see an evangelistic tent arrive at the warehouse. Following the labor's directions, Hugh and Wolf found the Adventist minister, missionaries and begged them, please, won't you hold meetings in Petaluma and Santa Rosa? Believing that this was a call from God, Lufbro and Bordeaux spent two months preaching to capacity crowds, debating local preachers, surviving an earthquake and a local epidemic, and baptizing the first 20 converts in California. Over the next year, they held over 300 meetings. Now you do the math, there's only 365 days in a year, and they're holding 300 meetings. They're not taking very many breaks, folks. They made more than 400 house calls. They baptized 90 converts, including Abraham LaRue. And some of you older ones remember the story of Abraham LaRue, who became our first missionary to China. He was converted by Lufbro and Bordeaux. And they established new churches. They debated hostile pastors. They faced brutal opposition. And they witnessed many miraculous healings as a result of their ministry. Despite all this activity, John was well aware of his shortcomings. After reading Ellen White's testimony number 18, he wrote a letter to her. He said, I see myself in the light of that testimony, a poor, selfish, self-indulgent, self-conceited creature. I want to get nearer to God. I want to write up the past, R-I-G-H-T, make it right. Make it right. I want to write up the past. So on New Year's, 1871, he made a vow, and he wrote it in his diary. And the vow was to be more earnest for the next year in all my duties. Oh, Lord, help me. And God certainly did. During his missionary service in California, that's 1868 to 1878, Elder Lepro pioneered a number of innovations for which you and I can be very thankful today. He started the California Missionary and Tract Society. That is the precursor of our ABCs, our Adventist Book Centers, the old T&Ms, Tract and Missionary Society. He sponsored the first Sabbath school conventions. In 1872, when the entire state had only 208 Adventists, he and James White organized the California Conference. He enthusiastically organized the first quarterly music conventions 
to improve the quality of singing in the church. As I pointed out last night, many Adventists were singing all right, but they were singing out of tune, off beat, and off key. And Loughborough, who had grown up attending singing schools, couldn't stand it. And so he organized these singing music conventions to improve the quality of music in the church. In 1875, citing Psalms 150, that short chapter, to bolster his case, Lupro persuaded members that organs should be a regular part of the congregations and its singing. Previously, the organ had been a, a home parlor instrument. You played Stephen Foster tunes on the organ. Old folks at home. The camp town, you know, ladies sing this song, doo-dah, doo-dah. Organs were not in churches. And Loughborough was the man to persuade Adventists to put pump organs in their churches. To praise God in tune, on the beat, in the same key register. We have Loughborough to thank for that. In 1876, he helped to organize the first children's vocal concert at the annual camp meeting. So he's a proponent of children's choirs as well. In addition, he and the Whites established the new paper, Signs of the Times, which would be published by the Pacific Seventh Adventist Publishing Company and is still going to this day. When they had that first issue of signs ready to be mailed, James and Ellen White and Dudley Canwright and John Lepro all knelt down on the floor in Canwright's room with the papers spread out before them. And they prayed and asked God's blessing on that fledgling little paper. And that blessing still continues today, as you know. Despite his hectic travel and preaching schedule, however, John often took time to recreate with his family. He went shopping with Maggie. He never called it shopping. He called it trading. Trading, T-R-A-D-I-N-G, a quaint 19th century term, trading. He took the kids for horseback and buggy rides. He spent hours weeding and watering his gardens, and his gardens were never small. They were acres large. He raised Phantom red chickens for their eggs, and he enjoyed family and church picnics. At one church picnic, he mentions in California, he caught a rattlesnake with 11 rattles and killed it. That is one big whopper of a snake. One rattle for every year, 11 rattles. He also gave his son Delmer sitz baths during his illnesses refusing to allow the local do doctors to give him the drugs that were popular on that time. He nursed Maggie during her frequent nervous spells. But although John rescued his son from dying of measles, he could not save Maggie. In 1875, Maggie was dying of tuberculosis, contracted from a woman she had taken into their home to nurse back to health. So she got the TB from this, this woman. On March 24, Margaret Newman Loughborough, age 35, died, leaving behind three children and a broken-hearted husband. So once again, he lost wife number two at the age of 35. Once again, John buried his grief in work, putting in long hours at the press to get out the signs, answer his growing correspondence, handle the many details that went with all his administrative duties, but more often now, he leaned on the expert help of a charming, attractive, New York-born woman. I pointed out last night, he only married New York women. All right, only New Yorkers. Something special about those New York gals. Named Annie Driscoll, the secretary treasurer of the Pacific Publishing Association. On December 7, 1875, James White married them and they spent their honeymoon night in James and Ellen White's home. Annie uh, inherited thus a ready-made family 
but she continued working at the Pacific Press. For the next 32 years, until she died in 1907, Annie would truly be the love of John's life. They raised three kids together, they traveled together, they wrote books and articles together, and they served as missionaries uh, overseas together. After 10 years in California, 1868-1878, Elder Lefbrook could take justifiable pride and satisfaction in the progress of the cause that he had pioneered on the West Coast. By 1878, the California Conference now had over 600 Adventists, had 22 churches, 11 ministers. It was the fifth largest conference in North America. The conference had to hold two annual camp meetings because there were so many thousands of people who attended. Remember, in the 19th century, camp meetings are not revival meetings for Adventists. Camp meetings are evangelistic-oriented gatherings. So in addition to the 600 Adventists, there would be two or three times that number of non-Adventists that would come to the camp meetings as well. The Loughborough family put down roots in the Oakland area. John's wife, Annie, worked for Pacific Press. But in July of 1878, James White upset the Loughborough apple cart. <laughs> they were comfortable in California. They expected to stay in California. And he said, no, I got plans for your family. We're going to send you to England. And he and his son, Willie White, thought that John should take charge of a brand new mission in Great Britain. Uncertain whether they should accept and unroot their three children, John and Annie prayed about the matter. Like Gideon of old, they put out the fleece. Lord, if you really want us to go, sell the house in the next two weeks. Now this was a time of depression. The 1870s were panic years. Houses weren't selling, but theirs did. Theirs did. In two weeks, they took it as a sign that God wanted them to go to, to England. Accepting this as God's approval, John and Annie made plans to start a new life in the British Isles. And once again, John wrote in his diary, we are going to great B-R-I-T-I-A-N, a new word to him, and he could misspell it, Britain instead of Britain. At the Yountville camp meeting that summer, members raised $4,000. As I mentioned last night, you got to multiply that by 25 to get the equivalent value today. This is about $120,000 today just for the English mission. And they contributed $84 worth of jewelry. California Adventists were wearing more jewelry than you do here in Rochester. $84 worth of jewelry for the same good cause. President Loughborough gave his final speech. He apologized for all the mistakes he had made, all the people he had offended, all the feelings he had injured. He resolved to be a faithful soldier of the cross of Christ in England. At the Grangeville camp meeting, temperatures got up into the 90s. Remember, men are wearing black wool suits in those days. They sang a newly composed farewell song of five stanzas. It went on so long, and Elder Loughborough was standing at the pulpit at the time. He became overcome by the heat. He fainted dead away, and they had to carry him off the platform. After he recovered, he and Annie and the children took the train for Battle Creek, where he preached in the brand new Dime Tabernacle, just been built, 1878. Then they went on to New York to bid their relatives and friends farewell before boarding a ship to marry old England. In November of 1878, they arrived in Boston, where they were supposed to kept, catch the ship Homer. But you know what? They missed the boat and saved their lives. Weeks later, they learned that the ship Homer had sunk in the Atlantic and all passengers and crew had drowned. God had delayed them 
from taking the ship they were supposed to take. Instead, they took the ship Nevada, and they made it safely to England. Within days of their arrival at Southampton, Elder Lepro and William Ings began holding four meetings every week in Shirley Hall, while Annie and the children uh, entered some rented quarters at Stanley College. In just three months, now think about it, 90 days, these tireless men preached scores of sermons. They visited 300 families, and they distributed thousands of signs of the times aboard the ships in the harbor. This is something we don't do anymore, but we used to. We used to have an active ship ministry going at all the major ports. In addition, they gave Bible studies, they started a Sunday school for children, and they established a Sabbath school for recent converts. By the end of their first year in England, the Loughboroughs had held 255 meetings. Now folks, that's about five meetings a week. They're not taking vacations. They're not taking breaks. In his so-called spare time, John Lepro studied French and German. He attended local political rallies. He planned Sabbath school parties. And in London, he visited churches and museums and indulged his weakness. Yes, Elder Lepro had a weakness. His diary reveals it. Licorice. Licorice is an English invention. We didn't have licorice here in the United States. He had never tasted it before. He bought it by the pound. And he later paid for it at the dentist's office. But Elder Lufbro had a weakness for licorice, and he bought lots of it. He went out there seeking larger accommodations. He wanted a place where the family could live and where the workers could live, all in one big mansion. And they could hold public meetings there. And they discovered such a place called Ravenswood. It was a 15-room mansion in Southampton with plenty of space for the family, the workers' offices, and public meetings. It was going for $200 rent a year because the locals were absolutely certain it was haunted. Strange moaning sounds were heard coming from that mansion. There was a moaning ghost somewhere in that house. They were sure of it. And so they, they let him have it for $200 a year. During an inspection tour, John discovered a broken pane of glass way up in the cupola. After he replaced that pane of glass, the ghostly moaning ceased. It was the wind coming off the Atlantic Ocean that was creating that moaning sound in that broken pane of glass. <laughs> At Ravenswood, Ings and Lufbro preached to 100 listeners every night. They started a Sabbath school for 40 converts, and John constructed a special baptistry down in the basement. He had to do that. They tried public baptisms in a nearby river, and it didn't work because rowdies would throw stones at them. So they needed a private spot for baptisms, and that's why he constructed that baptistry in the basement. In 1880, this old mansion became the headquarters for the British Tract and Missionary Society. John was the president, Annie, his wife, was the secretary treasurer. By 1881, the workers were printing special issues of the British Signs of the Times. Nonetheless, I think we need to realize Great Britain was a very difficult field for evangelism. In a letter to Mary White, Annie Loughborough stated, it takes strong faith and a very large amount of moral courage and a good supply of noble independence for an Englishman to break away from the strong national customs and to come out frankly and keep the Sabbath. Furthermore, those who converted often lost their jobs because you see in England, they didn't have the weekend yet. The work week went from Monday to Saturday. They only got Sunday off to worship. And so those who accepted the Seventh-day Sabbath often lost their jobs. If Elder Lepro was spiritually transforming the English, England was also changing him and his family. 
You see, 19th century American Adventists did not celebrate Christmas. They saw it as a pagan holiday, wouldn't have anything to do with it. But in Britain, the Loughboroughs, following local custom, decorated their Christmas trees with holly and candy and oranges and nuts. They exchanged gifts. They invited friends over for Christmas dinners. And when the English converts tasted Annie Loughborough's whole wheat bread gems, they went crazy. They had to have the recipe. And so John was soon mailing out gem bread pan patterns all over England. The cause in the British Isles was growing so rapidly that the General Conference decided to send some more laborers into that field. In December of 1881, Elder and Mrs. A.A. A. John, Elder George Drew, Miss Jenny Thayer arrived to assist the Loughboroughs. John's son, Delmer, who's now 18, also helped at the signs office. Their much needed assistance enabled John and Annie to spend two weeks down in Basel, Switzerland. And those of you who know your Adventist history, that should ring a bell. That's where John Andrews was a missionary down in Basel, and he was sick unto death, and they nurtured him and nursed him back to health. Back in England, John and Delmer often visited the British Museum. That was one of John's favorite places. Those of you who have been there know you could spend several days in the British Museum. It stretches for acres. They went to Buckingham Palace and St. James Palace. They went to St. Paul's Cathedral, and when they could get away from the office, they traveled by train all over England, the historic places and the scenic places. But John's regular study of Ellen White's testimonies helped him to see that his condition spiritually was not what it ought to be. After reading one 1882 testimony, he wrote to her son, W.C. White, I want to be nearer to God. I am determined more than ever to take hold of God's strength and have more of the divine in my labors. I shall seek it more. And he did. He seriously did seek a closer relationship with God. Although the high cost of living, class prejudice, Anglican opposition, and cold, rainy weather made public evangelism difficult in Britain, by the end of 1883, Elder Loughborough and his associates had established three churches with 70 Adventist members altogether. The British Tract and Missionary Society was thriving, 45 active members. They were mailing out thousands of copies of Signs of the Times, and by 1884, a new paper called Present Truth as well, besides tracts and missionary letters. And George Drew, among others, was still distributing literature on the ships every day, going down to the port, and giving literature to the sailors. Although Loughborough had been working in Britain for less than five years, God had richly blessed his labors. He had erected a solid spiritual foundation on which others could build. With new fields opening in the American West, the General Conference in 1883 voted to bring the Loughboroughs home again. In October of 1884, they sailed for the United States, arriving in Battle Creek in time for the general conference session. Now, you realize that for five years, they had spent their time in a cold, wet, windy climate, southern England. And when they came back to the United States, they both agreed, we want a warm, sunny environment. So they naturally headed for California. From 1884 to 1890, Oakland, would be their home. Within weeks of his arrival, Elder Leppo found himself elected to the boards of Pacific Press Publishing Company and Healdsburg College, which is now Pacific Union College. He was also elected president of the Rural Health Retreat, which became St. Helena Sanitarium and Hospital. His wife, Annie, became an auditor of various conferences and institutions. So they really didn't give him a vacation. He just arrives. And boom, 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 they elect him to a number of new offices. But Ellen White believed that this was not what God wanted Elder Loughborough to do. Her idea 
is that they should create a special position for LUPRO, minister without portfolio, all right? No assigned geographic ministry. Let this man roam around. Let him be a roving ambassador for God. Let him go to the camp meetings and the ministerial institutes and the teachers' institutes. Let him share how God had led in the early history of the cause. That was, that was her mission for Loughborough. So during the summer of 1884, she invited him to travel with her to the summer camp meetings. And as you know, you know, Ellen White would often go to a dozen camp meetings in one summer. I think one camp meeting usually tires most of us out, right? She'd go to a dozen. California, Washington, Oregon. These two old friends, now in their 50s, preached together on the Sawdust Trail, just as they had done in the 1850s and 60s. Church leaders, however, had, had their plans for John. Ignoring Ellen White's counsel here, in 1884, he was elected president of the newly formed Upper Columbia Conference. And that included all of the states of Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. That was not what she wanted him to do. So this lets us know that from time to time, even Ellen White was ignored. Although Elder Loughborough's heart and mind were certainly dedicated to the Advent cause, his pen and his tongue could sometimes be rather sharp and acerbic. In 1885 and 86, Ellen White, who was then in Europe, wrote him some testimonies urging him to have better spiritual discernment. Get more of Christ into your own soul, she counseled, and let your voice be softened, less sharp, less rasping. After reading her letter several times, John thanked her for all the wholesome words of reproof and counsel and good advice. I think I have made some advancement towards the right, he wrote her. I shall seek God's grace that I may deal tenderly while trying to reclaim the erring. I am earnestly seeking the Lord that he may give me a more full sense of my condition and need so that I may bear fruit to the glory of God. That was the way he always received her testimonies. Uriah Smith would buckle and bristle and resent, and later on he would relent. John Byington, if you've read my biography of him, would simply ignore what she had to say. But Loughborough would take it in and let it transform him into a better Christian. The Victorians had a saying that all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. What Elder Loughborough needed was more relaxation, more recreation, more time with his family and friends. Sometimes he simply needed to get away from the, the household. And when I say household, the Lufbros had 13 people in their house. In addition to the two of them and the three kids, they had eight or nine boarders. So it was like running a hotel. He needed to get away. So he started going on buggy rides, and he started exploring some of California's caves. Spelunking, we call it. Now remember, he's only five feet four inches tall, and he's only 110 pounds. That's kind of a perfect size for squeezing your way into small cave chambers, isn't it? He was pretty good at it. He also took up scrapbooking. Some of you are scrapbookers, right? He was a scrapbooker. And I'm, I'm thankful to a female friend of Elder Loughborough later on in life, the Center for Advanced Research at Andrews University has two of Loughborough's scrapbooks. He also loved to go on picnics, family picnics, church picnics, school picnics, and when overwork made him tense and a pinched nerve in his leg brought pain, he went to the St. Helena Sanitarium. And there he got all the massages that they knew about in those days. He'd get the hot bath, he'd get the lukewarm bath, he'd get the cold bath, he'd get the sits bath, he'd get the Turkish bath, he'd get the electric shock bath, he'd get them all. And he would walk out of there a new man, a new man. Weddings and receptions that followed were also joyous occasions for him. In 1886, his son Delmer, 22, married Marietta Stewart. 
The following year, his daughter Mary, 26, wed the conference auditor John Ireland, and Lupro presided at both weddings. In addition to his preaching, administrative, and writing responsibilities, Elder Lupro frequently organized new companies of believers into incorporated churches. He loved doing that. He loved doing that. During the 1880s, it appears that he largely lived out of his suitcase. He boarded with church members to save hotel and restaurant expenses. See, that's why I told Bill and Nancy, I'm going to be staying at your house. I'm saving expenses, right? I'm doing the Lupro thing. And by the way, this wasn't in my notes, but I might as well add it. I'm going to be done in three minutes, okay? I'm going to be done. Lovebro did something. Personally, I have never, ever heard anybody doing this. Lovebro tithed his birthday gifts. He tithed his Christmas gifts. And he tithed the value of the hospitality that people extended to him. Instead of paying, stay, you know, paying to stay in a hotel or a boarding house, he would estimate the value of the hospitality and he would give a tithe. Uh, I've never heard of anybody doing that. But God blessed because I know from looking at his diaries that the Loughbro budget was always in the black. And this is a man that's paid $15 a week. $15 a week. They're always in the black. There are no credit cards. There is no such thing as extending credit. You pay as you go. And the Loughbros were always in the black. In fact, as I will present to you this afternoon at 5 o'clock in part 3, Loughborough twice loaned the General Conference hundreds of dollars to keep it going. He had that much extra money on hand from the sale of his books. He bankrolled the General Conference when the treasury was practically empty. They always had money left over at the end of their month. And like I say, he's getting 12 to $15 a week, a week. And, you know, he's, he's paying out for the expenses that you and I have to pay out for. But he keeps that budget tight. In 1887, he also learned how to type on the newly invented calligraph machine. That's what they called typewriters when they were first invented, calligraph machine. I am a raw hand with a typewriter, he confessed, but I thought it might be easier to read than my writing. And as I was pointing out to Bill and Nancy on the way in, that's debatable because he typed his letters full capital letters. You know, you and I don't do that on the computer. It's considered shout outs. We don't want to shout at our friends by capitalizing our, but he would capitalize every, every word in the letter. And you know, that, that does get a little tedious to read after a while. In the fall of 1888, he was once again elected California Conference President. In 1889, he served as a temporary president of the North Pacific Conference with headquarters in Portland, Oregon. So he's California Conference President, <laughs> president up in Oregon. And there's no airplanes to get him back and forth. Suffering chills and fever, he wrote in his diary, I am exhausted. Wisely, he began taking more frequent naps. And I think it was the naps, and as we'll point out in part three, the cold baths. In my personal temperance life, I'm not there yet. How about you? <laughs> cold baths. I had a college roommate that did cold baths may have helped his health and his longevity to get him to 92 years. He was a temperance advocate, a cold shower advocate, a massage advocate, and a caving enthusiast. Please join us.
for the tour this afternoon. We will see some things that those of you who have lived in Rochester your entire life have never seen before. Things connected with Jay and Loughborough are right there 18 miles to your south. And no Adventist history tour goes to Victor, except for mine. And I took my tour there two years ago, and they were thrilled. They were thrilled. So those of you that can, join us. And then at uh, 5 o'clock out at the Edson Farm, we'll wrap up part three of the Loughborough story. I hope you're, you're coming to love this man. He's such a delightful fellow. All right, another old Adventist hymn I trust Howard has for us. <laughs> 